Good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to this first webinar in a series which is devoted to C. diff infection. My name is René van der Weingart, and I will be hosting today's webinar. Um, the series is organized by ESNM, a European Society for Neurogastroenterology and Motility, and one of its um, uh, subsections, which is the Gut Microbiota for Health section. And today we have two eminent speakers, um, but before we get started with our lectures, there's some things I have to uh, uh, discuss or mention. Um, and the first thing is, of course, to acknowledge our sponsors, um, um, which is uh, Faring Pharmaceuticals. So thank you, Faring, for uh, making this possible. And the second thing is to, to kind of guide you through uh, this platform, which I'm quite sure most of you will know. Um, so this is what you probably see when you're behind your computer. Um, and this is what you see when you're on your mobile phone. So what we're going to do is... Um, we're going to do the question and answer after the two uh, speakers. So after the second speaker, we, we start our question and answer. So meanwhile, when you're listening and you have questions, you can just push the button. You will get into this screen, type your question and send it. And then hopefully in the end, we can uh, answer all questions. So we'll, let's see how far we get. Um, the chat function, it's there, but we're only going to use it if you have some problem like a, a frozen video, audio issues. In the background, there is uh, Alyssa McGregor. Uh, Alyssa is from ESNM, and she will try to uh, figure out what's, what's wrong and, and help you out. Okay, having said that, um, we're going to start with our first speaker. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Joël Doré. Uh, he's heading several institutes and initiatives, but perhaps the most important one is uh, that he's the research director at INRA, the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment. And his research goal is to provide a better understanding of the intestinal ecosystem in order to support therapeutic choices in the medical area. Uh, and I really think that he definitely is one of the world's leading figures in gut microbiota research. And therefore, he is the ideal person to present on uh, the importance of gut microbiota in C. diff infection. So, Joel, uh, please go ahead. I'll stop sharing and give the floor to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, René, for the uh, nice introduction. So I will um, just lecture uh, for uh, some 20, 25 minutes on the importance of the gut microbiota in Clostridioides difficile infection, which I might still call it a few times Clostridium, probably. Um, and I'm really uh, honored and pleased to uh, open this uh, webinar series on Clostridioides difficile. Uh, Okay, uh, just a, a few links of interest I have to disclaim before I start. I have uh, given conferences for a number of uh, private companies. I also had uh, this contribution with my colleague Philippe Marteau on the editorial coordination of the book, uh, The Intestinal Microbiota, a full-fledged organ that was in 2017. Um, a lot of translational research funded in part by uh, industrial companies of the agro-food sector or pharma. And I'm also co-founder and scientific advisor of uh, Mad Pharma as of 2014 and uh, Novo Biome and GMT more recently. Um, so I'll tell you about humans, uh, saying, starting saying that we are microbial, we are ecosystems and symbiosis, each of us interacting with 50 trillion bacteria and many more microbes. Uh, 50 trillion, this is as many as we have human, ce human cells in the human body. Uh, and as we today uh, address that using uh, genomic sequencing, we know that we have on average in humans 600,000 microbial genes facing the 23,000 uh, human genes. So it's a massive, potentially massive functional contribution of the microbes. Um, microbiome science is changing the landscape uh, that we live with today with implications in preventive nutrition and medicine towards preventive medicine and precision medicine. The microbes we interact with are present on the skin and at every mucosal interface of the human body. This is in the uh, oral cavity and um, uh, the um, um, lung and respiratory tract, in the urogenital tract, as well as in the intestines, essentially the colon, where we have the densest and most diverse microbial population we interact with. Um, we have, over time, <clears throat> gotten to learn about the functionalities of our microbiota, essentially using uh, one tool which I call here glutenotobiology, which is derived from the ability we have to breed animals under 
uh, germ-free or axinic conditions. And comparison between axinic animals or germ-free animals and conventional uh, animals has allowed to pinpoint the contributions, the functional roles of the microbiota. <clears throat> So the intestinal microbiota is, uh, as we see it today, a key contributor to health and well-being. Um, it, has a, it is a rich, diverse, complex community of microbes acting at interfaces with food, with other microbes, and with the host. Uh, it's made of, as we mentioned, bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, and viruses and phages as well. Uh, each human has its own uh, dominant microbiota, although we do share a number of uh, bacterial species, for example. Um, and on average, for each individual, this is 300 bacterial species in a healthy uh, dominant gut microbiota. Uh, and we, as we see it, the microbiota we, we know acts as a regulator, endocrinometabolic regulator, immunoinflammatory regulator, as an antimicrobial shield, and neurovegetative regulator. And when it comes to um, risk of Clostridium difficile infection, then everything matters, I will say, but endocrinometabolic uh, regulator uh, functionality is really uh, essential as it will, um, or the microbiota will contribute to uh, the availability of uh, bile acids and their metabolism, secondary bile acids being quite important for the ability of Clostridioides difficile to colonize and to proliferate. Uh, of course, immunoinflammatory regulator is an important feature as it controls immunity overall and our status of immune responsiveness and antimicrobial shield. I will exemplify, but it's really uh, very important in the context of Clostridium difficile. Overall, the human intestinal microbiota, our inner ecosystem, is uh, composed of diverse microorganisms who are essential to its uh, functional homeostasis. And the richness of the microbiota is really a fundamental feature uh, for the global maintenance of our health. I will uh, specifically illustrate this point. Now, as we talk of the uh, ability of the microbiota to uh, essentially uh, drive the um, uh, competitive exclusion against uh, environmental microbes, including pathogens, I wanted to illustrate here one example of barrier effect, as we call it, which is the competitive exclusion by a single uh, symbiotic bacterium here, Ruminococcus navus, uh, strain E1, against a pathogen which is Clostridium perfringens. And the, uh, the graph is illustrating the dynamics of colonization of germ-free uh, mice in this example. So when inoculated with Ruminococcus navus, what we see is essentially uh, a very high rapid proliferation and a steady state level of 10 to the 10 uh, bacteria per gram of feces. And if we inoculate two days after Clostridium perfringens together with a passive transit marker, what we see is the transit marker is slowly eliminated by gut transit, while Clostridium perfringens, our model pathogen in this case, is most rapidly or more rapidly eliminated below the detection level of 100 per gram feces. And so this is an active process of elimination, which is in this case due to the ability of Romanococcus navus to produce a uh, trypsin-dependent bacteriocin a bioactive against the pathogen that allows the uh, elimination. Uh, there are many other contexts where elimination will be more simply uh, envisioned as an ecological process, uh, space occupation being one of the drivers of colonization prevention. <clears throat> Um, when we talk of microbiota host uh, interface and interaction, well, we know that there is constant microbe cell crosstalk, uh, a crosstalk or a dialogue between microbes we uh, interact with and our human cells. This is a monolayer, a single layer of human cells when we talk of the, uh, the gut wall, uh, and it allows passage of signals uh, that essentially upon normal conditions will drive homeostasis at the level of immunity. This is a, a production of um, T, uh, T cell, regulatory T cell signals, interleukin 10, uh, GREG3 alpha, for example, which maintain the responsiveness of the system, but also low tone uh, inflammation. And uh, illustrated here is also the uh, uh, 
uh, colonization prevention uh, ability. And when things are uh, altered or degraded, then we may enter a situation of inflammation. The signals from the bacteria may be pro-inflammatory actually, and we also disrupt the ability of the uh, bacterial uh, community to control proliferation of pathogens. And this is when we have increase in uh, cytokines that are signals of uh, pro-inflammatory condition and reduction of those that are more regulatory. <clears throat> uh, finally, the uh, host microbe or microbe cell cluster goes way beyond the gut wall uh, all the way to, uh, to the brain, actually. So gut wall integrity, immunity, oxidative stress, all control the um, uh, reaction we can have at the level of, of the brain. And perception of anxiety, for example, can be uh, uh, somehow controlled by that. And what essentially is documented today, and it's been worked on for the past uh, 10 to 15 years only, uh, is that when we have uh, symptoms and gut permeability inflammation at the level of the gut, then we may have actually neuroinflammation and perception at the level of the brain. And there are many routes of uh, crosstalk between the gut and the brain that go via the nervous uh, pathway or the blood pathway. Um, now, gut ecology is also a key component of uh, homeostasis and stability. Stability and adaptability of the microbiota and microbe host symbiosis is essentially uh, dependent upon features of ecology, which can be um, summarized to resistance and resilience of the system. And they do depend on essentially taxonomic or microbial redundancy, as well as functional redundancy, adaptability, oops, sorry, richness, uh, biodiversity, which is a measure of richness, and interactive networks between microbes. And what you see is that this will determine whether your system can be rather flexible or rather resistant to change, which is illustrated by the bead in the valley, more or less deep valley, or rather unstable and possibly uh, able to shift into a completely different uh, stable state. Um, I want to just emphasize briefly the importance of richness here, saying that uh, what we have shown when we study the uh, distribution of a human population here, it's uh, around 300 individuals, as a function of gene richness, which is numbers of genes between uh, less than 200,000 to more than a million per individual, what we do see is not a usual bell-shaped curve, but it's rather in the black line here, a, um, a two-sided curve with one segment on the low gene count side and one segment on the high gene count side. Uh, and actually in this population, European population, when we separate obese and non-obese, what we do see is a bimodal distribution. So it's truly two sets of populations, low gene count and high gene count. And what we documented over time is that uh, low gene count is associated with an alteration of metabolic and inflammatory traits in obesity, associated with non-response to calorie restriction, again, in overweight and obesity, associated to uh, severity and speed of progression in acute liver conditions. And in cancer treatment, it's also associated with reduced survival rate after hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. This is bone marrow transfer in uh, blood cancer, as well as non-response to cancer immunotherapies. In this latter um, domain, actually, it was also shown that uh, the resource or uh, recourse to antibiotics, as it drives a reduction in uh, biodiversity of the gut microbiota, will strongly impact the efficacy of immunotherapies when it's used two months before or one month within uh, the um, administration of immunotherapeutics. Okay, we, uh, we are microbial and we do become microbial or symbiosis, uh, starting from the moment of birth, which is this unique moment of uh, encounter with the microbial world. Uh, we develop our microbiota within the first months of life at the same time as we mature our immune defenses. And this leads to this unique situation where the gut microbiota has any cell, any tissue, any organ of the body is recognized as a component of self in terms of immunity. And maintenance of this symbiotic uh, relationship is essential to the maintenance of health and well-being. Now it's a complex system, so it's uh, fragile in a way, uh, and there can be uh, 
disruption at the level of ecology, this comes with a loss of the barrier function and hence a risk of infection. And when they, there is disruption at the level of immunity, immune tolerance, then there is loss of homeostasis and risk of immune mediated uh, affections. Now the microbiota is under the control or the impact of uh, numerous factors. Uh, and uh, these have been ranked in the context of epidemiological studies, uh, including studies performed in Belgium and um, Holland in, uh, in Europe. And it's shown that nutrition and drugs in general, antibiotics in particular, are really the top modulators of the microbiota. We know also that birth mode, uh, many events around birth actually, age, smoking, infections, including inflammation and other conditions, will also have an impact on the microbiota. And there are host factors that will impact the microbiota. Now let's enter uh, the risk of CD Clostridium difficile infection. Uh, with the impact of antibiotics on dysbiosis. What is illustrated here from this uh, publication is the, um, uh, the immediate impact after four and eight days on the microbiota in terms of richness to the left and diversity to the right. And essentially what is shown is that there is disruption, loss of richness, and over time, uh, after 42 and 180 days reconstruction, Roughly what is known in terms of a measurement is that 90% or so of the composition of the microbiota will be recovered completely. So there may be some long-term effect, effect, but overall what we see is a tendency for resilience. Uh, and uh, the depth of the valley is essentially an illustration of resistance to, uh, to change. Uh, what we see also is that there is a temporary loss of richness often associated with a pro proliferation of gram-negative, what I call proteobacteria, uh, uh, cousins of uh, Escherichia coli or Shigella, for example. And it's essentially an illustration of the fact that uh, upon antibiotic treatment, there are there is a strong ecological impact, there is an opening of ecological space, and this space tends to be occupied immediately by uh, more resistant uh, microbes, such as uh, Escherichia coli. Uh, mitigation uh, strategies for prevent preventive risk uh, might be to uh, apply antibiotic stewardship, obviously, but also there is use of a uh, adsorption of uh, residual intestinal antibiotics. We have a small company in France which is developing uh, charcoal-based uh, drugs that are able to trap antibiotics that remain uh, throughout the, uh, the transit and that will impact the gut microbiota. In this case, it's absorbed and it really uh, completely uh, abrogates the impact on the gut microbiota. And of course, there is a potential for reinforcement of ecological parameters such as resistance and resilience. And I will try to uh, illustrate that. More specifically, what is known uh, for Clostridioides difficile infection is that it's very commonly an antibiotic induced uh, or associated uh, infection. So basically what there is, uh, which is illustrated here is that antibiotics induce the alteration of the microbiota, which is here, uh, uh, illustrated by the loss in total counts of bacteria. And that opens ecological space. And when uh, Clostridioides difficile is present, it can be already present in the gut actually uh, by um, normal carriage where it's controlled at very low level by the normal microbiota, or it can be from the environment, be it the hospital environment. And then when it reaches level above roughly 10 to the eight per gram uh, stool content, then it will produce toxins and induce colitis. Uh, when the uh, microbiota restores, come back to normal, uh, hopefully it will, uh, it will be uh, diminished and controlled. Um, what is known actually is that uh, if upon the first episode there is control by antibiotics, then it's an old story, but if it does not work, then there is a potential for relapse. Upon first recurrence, uh, the rate of chronicization is 45%. And upon second recurrence, the rate of chronicization is up uh, around 65%. So we need to think of ways to modulate uh, ecological uh, context and possibly resilience. 
Um, more specifically, when there is recurrent Clostridium difficile infection, then it's associated with major perturbations or alterations and loss of microbiota richness. On the left-hand side, what we see is controls. Uh, first episode of Clostridioides difficile infection, recurrent Clostridioides difficile infection, and where we see the most uh, or the biggest alteration is when we have recurrent alterations. Uh, in these uh, three individuals example, the first one is highly dominated by firmicutes, i.e. dominant gram-positive bacteria. The second dominated by proteobacteria, these are uh, usually not dominant um, gram-negative bacteria, and the third is uh, dominated by very orchomicrobia, so you see that there is a major alteration, and this can differ from one person to another. And what you see on the right is that for controls, we usually have a very high uh, curve, which means a very high richness in numbers of types of bacteria, numbers of species of bacteria, uh, with uh, the first occurrence of Clostridioides difficile, it's a bit lower, and when there is recurrent, then it's the lowest, a major impact on overall richness of the microbiota. And so this is a strong indicator of dysbiosis. <clears throat> now, mitigation can come with, uh, uh, in the example illustrated here, probiotics. So there are a few, uh, well, quite a number actually of publications where uh, probiotics have been attempted to, to mitigate antibiotic-induced dysbiosis and sometimes especially in the context of Clostridioides difficile. What is shown here is the impact on the proliferation of Escherichia shigella groups. Um, of course, very low levels in controls and uh, controls with Saccharomyces boulardii. When the individuals are treated with amoxicillin, uh, then there is a high impact in terms of proliferation, and it's, it's quite well controlled by the co-administration of amoxicillin and Saccharomyces boulardii. And it also translates in symptoms uh, based on scores of diarrhea by the GSRS score. Uh, and so a potential here for the control of the impact of um, antibiotics on uh, gut microbiota composition, possibly higher resistance and resilience, uh, higher speed of recovery uh, with the Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, there are enough studies for Saccharomyces boulardii, especially randomized control trials to, uh, uh, to do uh, meta-analysis. So what is shown here is that there is indeed over a number of studies, a positive impact of uh, Saccharomyces boulardii CNCMI745 uh, on the mitigation of symptoms associated with the uh, antibiotic treatment. <clears throat> that has overall led to recommendations. So these are the recommendations of the EPSAGAN, the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, uh, and the European Society for Pediatric Infectious Disease. Uh, 2016, there actually may be uh, more recent documents that I have uh, not pulled out actually, but uh, you will hear more about that during this webinar series. Uh, and what I want to stress is that uh, here the, uh, the quality of evidence is only moderate for overall antibiotic-associated diarrhea prevention in children. Uh, and it's yet a strong recommendation because there aren't much else to propose. Uh, and the quality of evidence when we talk of the risk of uh, Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea is rather low. And the recommendation is lower, obviously, uh, conditional. And the same is true for adults where both the Cochrane collaboration proposed these uh, recommendations, as well as the World Gastroenterology Organization for the prevention of antibiotic-associated Clostridioides difficile infection. And there are two probiotics that are uh, pointed out in this case, Lactobacillus rhamnosus strain GG, and again, Saccharomyces boulardii strain CNCMI 745. So we have these tools. Their impact is uh, moderate, but it's uh, sufficiently significant over a number of studies that it is proposed by the uh, higher uh, uh, learning uh, societies. And I just want to finish with uh, uh, an illustration of fecal microbiota transfer 
I repeat the term transfer, not transplantation, and we can discuss about that if you want. Um, and this is essentially a strategy of whole ecosystem microbiotherapy, an approach that aims to restore a functional symbiosis via the restoration of a balanced gut ecology. Essentially, the goal is to displace a dysbiotic microbiota by the administration of a what we call eubiotic microbiota from a healthy uh, person. Uh, and this really uh, uh, has changed quite a bit with the publication from Van Nood and colleagues in 2013 published in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed that if you compare the last resource antibiotic, in this case vancomycin, whether administered simply or after bowel cleansing, which I call lavement here, sorry for the French, um, on percentage of patients that are cured of the pathogen, uh, at best, 30% or so, with fecal microbiota transfer, one course or uh, two or three, depending on whether the first one did work or not, then the, uh, the difference is also, uh, as, as you can see, quite dramatic, more than 80% cure upon the first attempt and above 90% cure upon the second or third attempt uh, of fecal microbiota transfer. Uh, actually, the clinical trials was due to include um, around 90 uh, patients in each arm, and it was uh, interrupted upon intermediate analysis after 16 uh, patients at, at most for each arm, uh, considered not ethical to go any further owing to the extreme difference between uh, the treatment, uh, the new treatment and the standard of care. And it was rather rapidly acknowledged by the regulatory agencies, and it's been applied ever since uh, to cure thousands of patients. I think these conditions were made a bit complicated by the uh, COVID pandemic, but still it's applied uh, today. And the American Gastroenterology Association, as early as 2013, uh, already proposed recommendations for uh, the ways to, uh, to proceed, actually, to use this, um, this tool as a treatment. It's unusual for the regulatory agencies to consider a biology, biologically active um, treatment as a drug, but this is what uh, many agencies have done. This is what we also have in France, actually. And I just want to um, uh, well, add a few things before I finish. FMT should be seen as essentially an ecological cure to an ecological disease. Uh, and uh, just to illustrate what uh, Matt Pharma uh, is doing in France, it's applying a fecal microbiota transfer in context of uh, cancer treatment. And this is patients that are treated for uh, acute myeloid leukemia. They, have, uh, they undergo an induction chemotherapy, very severe chemotherapy, very often followed by uh, antibiotic treatment. Uh, and what happens in terms of microbiota composition is that compared to this baseline microbiota with the uh, many lines on the surrounding, as you can see, which are, correspond to different bacterial species, essentially after the induction chemotherapy and antibiotics, there is one dominant bacterial taxa in this one context, Enterococcus. Uh, and after autologous readministration of the microbiota, it essentially reconstructs fully the uh, microbiota diversity. And it goes beyond. We can actually also demonstrate in this context that it restores immune homeostasis, for example. So I will finish with just uh, giving um, a few um, things to uh, remember or take home messages. Humans are microbial, they are ecosystems. Uh, tissues and organs of the human body uh, interact with microbiota in a symbiotic fashion. Alteration of host microbe symbiosis leads to loss of protective functionalities. Uh, and in the context of antibiotic treatment, the uh, functionality that is lost is essentially uh, the barrier function, uh, which is um, driven by alteration of intestinal ecology. Alteration of intestinal ecology leads to loss of barrier function and with this, a risk of infection. And Clostridioides difficile may actually take advantage of altered intestinal ecology to colonize. Uh, and among the mitigation strategies, uh, which I have tried to uh, illustrate a little bit, uh, uh, are strategies that will aim to prevent exposure, to reinforce ecological robustness, and in the case of recurrent or chronic conditions, to uh, possibly fully restore a functional ecosystem and a functional symbiosis. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention and I will uh,
pass on the word to uh, uh, Gail for the next uh, presentation. As I said in the beginning, um, the question and answer will be after the second speaker. Um, so this also means that you can still put your questions for um, uh, Joelle in the Q&I. Just push the button and, and fill in your question. And same goes for the presentation of Gail that will follow now. Um, so Gail um, is involved in, uh, Gail Atara, sorry. Uh, Gail is involved in numerous uh, patient-centered um, non-profit organizations. But today she will speak on behalf of the Canadian Gastrointestinal Society, where she is a CEO and she's responsible for day-to-day -day operations. Now, I read a short bio on, on a society's website, and then I read about Gil's motto, which is the patience come, comes first, which I like very much. Uh, so I'm also convinced that she's the ideal person to speak on uh, the patient's perspective of C. diff infections. So uh, Gil, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, just in full disclosure, I have not never had C. difficile infection, but I'm representing the patients who contact us and who we have done extensive research with. So I'll go through that fairly quickly. I've got about 10 minutes and then we'll have time for questions. So, um, sorry. There we go. Uh, so if you want to check out us, we're based in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada and uh, our website's available. Uh, we have, uh, during 2021, we had 7.8 million page views. So it's a very popular website and you can find all of us on all these other social media platforms as well. We're a patient group started 46 years ago and I've actually been the CEO for 26 years now. So we have patient resources. We generally distribute these throughout Canada and we have the, all of our resources are available in English and French. We have a pamphlet on the uh, C. difficile. We also have a video. I encourage you to go ahead and watch that in English or French. You can find it on our mot de ventre website in French, uh, but you can all fi find everything through the English site as well. So we did a, a patient survey in 2017 to find out what their, the experience was. We had 167 respondents only in Canada. Uh, we wanted to look at specifically what was going on and uh, there were 77% female and 77% um, uh, were 30 to 69 years of age, 10% were younger than 30, which was very interesting in information for us. 13% were 70 or older, and 19% of respondents are healthcare professionals. So, and 49% of those worked in a hospital, which we find very interesting. Uh, and you'll see some comments later from them as to why that was particularly difficult experience for them. So we asked them how long it was from the onset of diarrhea until they received a diagnosis. And uh, as you can see from this, that some, some patients waited a very long time, like just, just under 10% waited more than 30 days to get a diagnosis. So that, that, that means we have to be, be, be more clever in determining what is C. difficile. Uh, we had to ask them how many times they had it. Some people didn't really remember, but mostly, um, you know, there was a good portion of 33% who had it more than once. Uh, we asked uh, how many days after starting treatment did your symptoms completely resolve? And, uh, you know, again, I, I want to just draw your attention to this end of no resolution to, to, to the symptoms. And, and, and this is really an important factor for quality of life. Uh, and, and also thinking of all uh, or all subsequent experiences, which treatments have you used to combat uh, C. difficile infection? And I think that that's, a, that's a, a critical thing because this was done in, again in 2017. Things have changed so much since then. And so, um, you know, the fact that some use just probiotics was unusual, I think, but uh, at the most point uh, for treatment, you'll see that the primary thing was um, antibiotics. And, but have you been taking antibiotics in the three months preceding diagnosis? And clearly there's a direct relationship between taking antibiotics and the developing of C. difficile infection. And again, you'll see in some of the material that I'm sharing, some of it has the old name for C. diff and some has the new name for C. diff because we did go through a recent name change. Um, so uh, the quality of life is the biggest thing I think I need to point out about C. diff and that is, um, the rate 
of quality of life before, during, and after a CDR infection on a scale of one to six. Uh, this is how the patients rated. And um, we asked for those who had experienced CDI and the caregivers of those, because some of the older individuals did have caregivers. And um, while we expected and found a decrease in the quality of life during infection, many patients continued to experience a decreased quality of life uh, after the resolution of CDI, very important. And it, this was especially strong for the caregiver's uh, interpretation of how the patient was, um, how the patient responded. So 13% of their responses had a quality of life of only one or two before CDI and 73% um, and of having a quality of life of one or two after resolution. So you can see that CDI really affected their quality of life and it had a very long lasting effect. Uh, so the conclusions from our survey report um, and what we did is we, we, we did the survey report and then we delved in much deeper and then had that study published in a, in a peer reviewed journal. So the conclusions that we reached at this point was that uh, CDI is a serious infection with devastating symptoms that greatly affects quality of life mm -hmm. and that many of our, of our respondents had several bouts of CDI and were hospitalized. Um, the timeliness of diagnosis remains an important hurdle for healthcare professionals to overcome uh, so that they can treat infection before it becomes too severe and increases in prevalence. So again, we were very concerned about uh, the continuation of C. diff in the community, not just in the hospital. So these we uh, represented, uh, you'll see the first, the first one there is a poster we had at a medical conference. And then we, in 2020, we've published this uh, thing in patient preference and adherence, this study that goes into great detail. And if you want to look at either one of these, they're available on our website. It's, website. it's an open access journal. And so you can download it or, or read it more fully on our website, uh, just search for it. It's pretty easy to find uh, there with all the other resources. <clears throat> I'm gonna shift gears slightly because we um, we had a recent uh, patient focus group. And oh, and I should also disclose that the uh, we got an unrestricted grant from Merck uh, Canada to do the patient survey in 2017. And then more recently, we've got a grant from Faring to look at really delve into the patient journey with C. difficile. And so here's some of the information from a uh, focus group we held at the end of February this year. So we found that there was a lack of steady clinical care. And again, this context is Canadian. Uh, there was no one path to diagnosis, treatment, or recurrence. It was all over the map. Participants shared vastly different experiences when initially seeking medical help, like from, from when they received diagnosis and which treatment options, especially during recurrence, that they didn't even know what to do next, or even that there could be a recurrence. The majority of participants sought care from, uh, for a different condition first and later acquired or learned about their C. diff while being treated for something else. And a lot of this happened. We also deal with patients who have other GI conditions. Uh, we cover everything from gum to bum in our charity. And so we uh, have people who have inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome. And so some of those individuals uh, found that they were being treated perhaps in hospital for all sort of colitis and then ended up being also diagnosed diagnosed with C. difficile because there was some confusion around some of the symptoms. <clears throat> Excuse me. We found that they, uh, they really had uh, suffered in isolation and this was even before the pandemic. So uh, there was a lot of concern about that. The stigma of being unclean was a very important uh, learning. And uh, one person said that she was feeling like she was toxic waste, which is really a brutal thing for a patient to go through. So uh, there was anxiety that the disease could come back, a fear of having an accident. This was really high for many patients the disease was downplayed for some and intensified for others. It was really interesting. We had one patient who had HIV and so they barely, they really minimized the C. diff because they were always focusing on, on her HIV. And then um, they were very, given very limited information about the disease itself, including the potential for recurrence. And so we saw that there's a real need for like the assets we have in terms of pamphlets and video that patients need to see these things so they know what a little bit more about the disease itself. Um, 
as somebody said that C. diff is almost worse than cancer, she had experienced both. And uh, that this is quite striking because we all know the impact and the mental health impact of cancer as well. Um, and so that when you're infectious, they say your life is on hold. It's like you're a leper. And the worst part was not being able to be around people because you're afraid of causing them what you're going through and you'd wish it we wouldn't wish it on your worst enemy. You just feel like contaminated waste walking around and you just want it over with. You just want it to end. I mean, this is traumatic. This is what the patients are going through. And then this last one here, which was C. diff gave me the feeling of embarrassment and shame, especially working in a healthcare organization. This is what I spoke about earlier is that, you know, if you're working in healthcare and you get C. diff, there's stigma around it because it's often spread through not washing your hands. And so, you know, your peers might look at you as if to say, oh, mate, wow. You, you didn't take care of yourself or you didn't you didn't follow the protocols that were necessary. So one last slide here, and this is that we are currently working on mapping out the C. diff patient journey. We'll have it available on our site. I just did this very rudimentary. So you can see the idea that there were some things going on, but for the most part, um, we're going to have a very detailed uh, infograph that we'll be able to, to share. And if you want to follow us on our website or check in, or we have an e-newsletter you can sign up for on our website, then you'll be able to see the results from that as they come out. And coming up on my 10 minutes, I just want to say thank you very much for listening. And uh, I hope you got a lot out of today, both mine's and Joelle's uh, talks. And that if there's anything you want to reach out to, uh, there's my contact information. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gil. Um, well, I think it's it's really very important that we uh, learn more about the, the patient's side of things. Uh, uh, and I think also that we are two fantastic presentations. So thank you both. Um, so now we have, I think, some 10 minutes or so, 15 even, for Q&A. Um, uh, I know that Joel can also see the questions, so perhaps he can already look into some of them and see what, which one he wants to answer first. Yes. Let's start off uh, with Gil, if, you, if, you, if you're okay with that, uh, because it, it's more of a personal question, really, because from, from scientists' side of view, we, we, I think we should involve patients more in, in what we do. But on the other hand, it's also quite difficult because sometimes the questions we are trying to answer are very difficult. Uh, we, we don't know exactly how to engage patients. Do you think that we need to do that? And how should we do that? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, very strong opinion, actually, I, because I, I'm, I'm a really strong advocate in Canada for uh, patient participation. I also work with Health Technology Assessment International on things, and I think it's vital. Sometimes we just don't ask the right question right at the beginning. You know, what is it the outcome that you're looking for? Well, what does the patient really want? Like the patient doesn't really care about so much counting the number of bowel movements that they have necessarily, but they might care more about uh, the explosiveness of a di of diarrhea and how yeah. that, that just devastates them you know it, they, they talk about the smell that the smell is the worst thing they've ever had so I mean bringing that in might help ways for physicians to mitigate some of those things going forward and giving patients the right tools so that they can manage living with the disease so yeah I 100% agree that we need those individuals right away and well my personal problem is I don't know how to engage patients how, how would how would you through patient groups, I think is the best thing because that you know they come to us. We hear their stories all the time. We have a thing on our website, bad, your bad gut story. We get submissions constantly about everything from diverticular disease right through to reflux disease and how some of those things that we think are even easy conditions to manage. We find that some patients really struggle, and so you know there are could be be patient groups in every community. I've met up with patient groups all over the world. And so I think that if you, tr you, you try to keep in touch with your local patient groups, as well as international ones, I think you'll get a really good sense of what patients are going through. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps I should clarify. I'm not a clinician. That's why as a basic yeah. scientist, perhaps more difficult. Yeah. Okay. Um, Joel. Yep, Did I'm also a basic scientist. <laughs> I'm also a basic scientist. I have to clarify that I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I think I, I can try and take a few questions uh, in a row, basically. Clara was asking uh, <clears throat> uh, whether uh, or to confirm whether antibiotic cause, uh, um, uh, so is it modification of or proliferation of gram negative bacteria? And actually, when you have this alteration of uh, gut ecology, you leave open ecological space and any microbes who 
is adapted to these conditions uh, will tend to proliferate. The reason why very often we have gram-negative bacteria is <clears throat> either because they carry resistance to the antibiotics that are being used or because they resist better to the uh, stress conditions of the system. For example, there can be uh, oxidative stress coming together with some inflammation and they resist rather well. And so they will, they will proliferate. <clears throat> Um, mitigating the risk uh, with probiotics. I think that uh, probiotics is a, is a way to go because we have uh, enough data to uh, consider that uh, there is some effect. It's not dramatic, but at least it's some effect, so it's some improvement. Uh, and I, I would tend to send you to the uh, website of the uh, World Gastroenterology uh, Organization, WGO, uh, which is proposing um, top antibiotics for this kind of condition uh, with, with antibiotics. So this is an important point, actually. When relying on probiotics, you want to use them at the same time as you're taking the, the antibiotic, which will disrupt the microbiota. So you want to reinforce the ecology as you are knocking on it because this is the best thing you, you can do basically. Uh, I think we can be optimistic with alternative solutions. I mentioned a small company in France, Davoltera, which is developing a tool that you ingest as a pill. And it's actually trapping small molecules in the uh, intestine and that will trap remaining antibiotics. And so it will diminish the impact on the gut microbiota. Uh, all the way to uh, almost no impact on the basis of what we've been uh, studying. So it's quite dramatic. Let me take another question. Yeah, um, of course. Mohsen is saying, what is the difference between resistance and resilience? So it's uh, definitions of ecological uh, components. Uh, and resistance is essentially the uh, ability of the system to uh, to be less altered. So when you look at the dynamics, it's alteration and reconstruction. Uh, resistance refers to how deep uh, the valley and a resistance microbiota will not be so much altered basically. And resilience is the time to reconstruction. And so it's the ability of the system to go back. It's actually a term of uh, psychology initially, uh, and it's been used in, in biology for these illustrations. I have a question from Lucille on uh, FMT uh, for the, the treatment. So, um, She's uh, saying treatments such as FMT has successfully implemented to prevent a recurrent Clostridium difficile. It's actually not to prevent, it's uh, to treat. And so when there is recurrent Clostridium difficile infection is when the uh, regulator agrees that it's used in the clinics. Um, what are the most promising treatment to avoid the first episode? So actually, I wouldn't say it's a treatment. If it's to avoid, it's a prevention. And so we, um, well, we don't have much at, as far as I can tell. Uh, and I mentioned probiotics, uh, and I think that this is the best way to go. So if you know that there has to be some antibiotic treatments in the process, um, it should probably be recommended in the hospital context, except for some that are provided in sachet and that clinicians don't want to see around in the hospital because it tends to uh, spray uh, powder. Uh, and you don't want that in the hospital, obviously, if you have people with catheter and things like that. So except for some of the, those, they, they, in my view, should probably be uh, recommended. But you know, perhaps the question was, why not use FMT in first instance? Uh, and why well, is but, antibiotics the first thing you want to do? Um, for Clostridium difficile, well, that's yeah. the process. When when it was initially recommended by the regulator, it was after three attempts. So it was recurrence after three, then it went to two, then it went to one. Today, it's uh, still the standard of care is one attempt to uh, antibiotic treatment first. Uh, it's possible that in the future, it will come first line, uh, but it's still a bit uh, complicated to uh, set up. And so this is probably the reason why it's not yeah. implemented first line and also not systematically implemented, I would say, probably. Yeah. But it, I, I do get the point that it's kind of counterintuitive that antibiotics use will give you C. diff infection and then you use it to clear it, you know. That's, that's agreed. It's, it's indeed counterintuitive. I'm a microbial ecologist and I really don't like the idea of using antibiotics, but this is the progress, uh, yeah. the way medicine progresses. Okay. Um, I think Moshen was asking more about uh, autologous enema, the example I was giving at the end, 
uh, actually uh, this is a context where patients upon diagnosis of acute uh, myeloid leukemia uh, have not received so many uh, treatments before and so their microbiota can be quite intact uh, and um, it was uh, agreed with the regulator again here uh, that as long as there was no pathogen that could be detected in their microbiota, then it was okay to re-administer uh, the patient its own microbiota. So it's really as a proof of concept. And in this case, what we were able to demonstrate is that we have more than 90% recovery of the microbiota um, as it was before, basically. Uh, I have uh, Buwan who is asking, it was, uh, please throw light on fecal transfusion on transplants. So um, more on FMT, what can I say? It's uh, only one indication, Tosphidioides difficile infection, where it's uh, recognized by the regulator as the recommended action after the first uh, antibiotic. And all the rest because it's being tested in hundreds of trials today. All the rest is essentially uh, research uh, uh, that hopes for uh, phase two and phase three positive trials and then uh, occurrence of the application in the clinics. Uh, for Clostridium Clostridioides difficile, it went through phase three, positive phase three, two uh, groups actually, one in Sweden and one in the US. And this will lead to uh, uh, market access for, for this treatment very soon for Clostridioides difficile. But it's already being used every day, actually. Um, well, there's more questions dropping. Uh, I have one from Gus, which is uh, asking whether prebiotics will do the same as probiotics for C. Diff. So pre probiotics are live microorganisms. I mentioned uh, Saccharomyces boulardii and Lactobacillus uh, rhamnosus. Uh, prebiotics are molecules. They are molecules that are non-digestible by the human enzymes, and that will reach the colon and possibly modulate the microbiota. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't know of any trial that has tested prebiotics as a means to reinforce the microbiota of uh, recurrent CDI patients. Uh, and that's what I had anticipated so far. So all the rest is uh, questions that come new. Uh, and I can try and take a few if you want, uh, René. Yeah, the, you think about them. Perhaps Gail has to add something. Yeah. Um, most of the questions are directed to Joel, to be honest. Um, but Gail, listening to the Q&A, perhaps you have some remarks you want to put. I think the patients want to reach out right away for uh, a probiotic. They're, they, that, you know, they want to do it that way. Uh, so, I, and I think that they're using a lot of them. Uh, and, and I'd love to hear back from Joel whether you, whether you think that, um, uh, you know, reaching randomly for probiotics that uh, might not have all the same uh, clinical trials is a good thing or not. And, and we're always telling patients to wait to see. We have a guide in Canada uh, that's published that says these are the ones that have been tested in Canada and yeah. we know yeah. that they have. So what do you what would you say to them about randomly using probiotics? Well, I mean, it's it's um, uh, for healthy individuals or for mild symptoms. It's really no risk. So why not? You make your own trial and error. But I don't think that for patients, it's a good idea. Um, and yet, uh, many clinicians or many medical doctors will not direct you towards, uh, direct you towards this or that, uh, which is why I emphasize the fact that uh, learning societies have actually recommendations that you can uh, base your decision on. Uh, and there's very few probiotics that are proposed by those uh, on the market if I can say so, you find tons and tons of probiotics and very few that have been actually documented for their ability to do anything. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would agree with you, Gail, that uh, there is need to, uh, for some caution. Um, and if you are a patient, then you want to basically uh, go by what is very robust. And even though the effect can be mild, still you want to just go for the ones that have been really strongly scientifically uh, documented. Okay, um, well, I think you can answer one more question if you want to, Joel, and then we have to wrap it up. Um, the, the one that comes just after the one I answered is, uh, uh, what are the hottest topics in uh, CDI research uh, should be conducted in the future? So there is, um, there is work on the uh, development of vaccines, actually, and this is really basic science at this stage, but uh, it 
it would be uh, quite nice to uh, have that at hand, obviously. Uh, and there is work on around the context of a uh, um, fecal microbiota transfer. There is one demonstration that um, filtered uh, human intestinal uh, content suspensions, filtered no bacteria, nothing live in there, except that uh, you still have many of the metabolites of the gut microbiota, the healthy gut microbiota, that can do the job in, uh, in quite a number of, uh, or a, a high proportion of patients. And so probably we can think in the future of medical applications along those lines. Um, and uh, I heard in the discussion and in the presentation also of uh, perceptions from patients from what Gail was presenting that uh, uh, there is a strong perception of uh, being dirty and being at risk of contaminating people. Um, and I would like to say with that uh, in mind that uh, we, or very many of us actually do carry Clostridioides difficile, but because we have our normal microbiota, which is quite healthy, then it's just controlling by the barrier effect I mentioned, the level of Clostridioides difficile below uh, a level where it can become a problem. And so as long as we don't have surgery or treatment or antibiotics or so on, we are not at risk because our gut microbiota controls things. Um, and so uh, I think that it's, it's uh, in a way um, uh, a, a perception that is uh, uh, probably stressing the patient, but it probably shouldn't because most of the people around them have their own healthy microbiota that is controlling everything basically. And so they are not at high risk of being contaminated. It's not like a viral contamination. That's mm. what I mean to say. I think I'll leave it here. Advice. I have a few more, more questions that I can address uh, out, outside of the, uh, the timing of this uh, seminar. Okay. So thank you, Joel. Uh, yeah, it works. So uh, this leaves me uh, to, to finish this uh, webinar, um, uh, thanking again our sponsors and our two excellent speakers. I think we heard two very good presentations. So thank you both for uh, giving these lectures uh, and um, announcing, of course, the next in the lecture series, which will be on April 26 and is an introduction to C. diff infection. So uh, thank you uh, for being here and um, hope to see you next time.